one continent under this is dedicated to indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere. Dedicated to indigenous people. From Mexico, people. reservations, and what is called the United States, all the way to Tierra del Fuego. Tierra del Fuego. We are one people, one, one, people. Continent, one continent, under occupation. Under occupation. Indigenous movement, we're lighting up the torches. Tired of genocide and liberation, they approaches. Indigenous movement, we're lighting up Tired of genocide and liberation, they approach us. We keep walking on our stolen land. land. Skip in poverty, with chains on our hands. We are ancient owners of this continent. No matter how hard they try, we will never forget. But ignorance does not let us understand. Since 1492, they've been squatters on our lands. Blinded by the lies that we fail to see. That we are the survivors of the biggest genocide. White supremacy is kicking and alive. Keeping us from truth and vision from our eyes. Keeping us from truth and vision from our eyes. Indigenous movement for life. Torches, tired of genocide or liberation, they approach us. Indigenous movement, we're lighting up the torches. Tired of genocide or liberation, they approach us. Look into the mirror and you will see our past. Hidden and forbidden, the slavery won't last. We are waking up and starting to demand the truth and justice. We're taking with our hands. Look into the mirror and you will see our past. Hidden and forbidden, the slavery won't last. We are waking up and starting to demand. Man, the truth and justice, we're taking with our hands. Indigenous movement, we're lighting up the torches. Tired of genocide or liberation, they approach us. Indigenous movement, we're lighting up the torches. Tired of genocide or liberation, they approach us. They wish that we can dissolve and quit with sand to the fits of history. And the truth they cannot stand. Our blood is the fuel that they use to keep this going. When recycling a sweat, the old shit keeps growing. They bury our identities in our ignorance. They want us to believe that we are just like them. That we also jumped up the main flower so they can keep all of our fucking power to our land and all of our resources. We are the walking corpses. Indigenous movement, we're lighting up the torches, tired of genocide, our liberty. They approach us, indigenous movement. We're lighting up the torches, tired of genocide or liberation. They approach us. Reconstruction of our, our nation is a matter of dedication. How bad do we want our total liberation? Eurocentric thoughts become a memory of the time when we were in slavery. Colonial concepts mean nothing to me. Hispanic and Latino, we fail to see. Hey, what's up? What's up, everybody? Can you let me know if you can hear me okay? I usually have two laptops when I'm working on this, but today I only have one. So welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? <laughs> I am really excited for today. Uh, just to let you know, I'm gonna be doing the classes only 30 minutes on a monthly basis because it's hectic. You know, I have a six month old. It's family time. Y'all understand me. Uh, anyway, uh, let me know if you can hear me okay. <laughs> yes. So what you just heard right now, it's a rap song I wrote like 2015. <laughs> you know, for those of you who don't know, I love music. I love uh, hip hop, rap music. I love corridos. I love banda. Um, that's just my, you know, that's my, my passion. So yeah, that song is, I have it on YouTube. If y'all ever want to download it or whatever, it's not like on Spotify. I'm far from that, far from that. Uh, <laughs> just want to make sure you could hear me. Okay. Before we get started, I have Smoke Along, Reina, Alitron. Uh, how y'all doing? Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> All right, so we are going to get into, we are starting. It is Saturday, August 28th. Let me see, can someone give me a, a heads up? Let me know if you can hear me okay before I start the talk today. Give me like a up, un corazoncito. <laughs> Let me know you can hear me. I'm watching the comments on my phone, so bear with me. Can y'all hear me? Awesome, beautiful. Thank you so much, Les. 
Okay, so first and foremost, my name is Sitlali Sitlalmina Nawak. I am historian, poet, activist, and I am very honored to share space with you. Like I was saying, I am going to be doing my classes uh, 30 minutes once a month. I do have a private course that I'll get into at the end of the class, but I want to get into it right away. Let's go. Today, we're going to be talking about manufacturing Latin. For those of you who are just joining us, if you want to let us know where you're tuning in from, what indigenous territory you are on, um, what nation or tribe you represent, if you're reconnecting native, if you are a connected native, if you are searching for your identity, you are in the right place. Welcome to E-Decolonize class number six. We are gonna get into manufacturing Latinidad. I'm gonna share with y'all everything I possibly can in this 30 minutes about why these terms are general, why is pro-white supremacy and how it erases all of our people. So into it, yes, that's the song. <laughs> yes, I, I'm not a rapper, but I rap, all right? Uh, I'm a poet, so I just put a little song to it and that, that was that you can hear on YouTube, check it out. Um, per usual, um, per usual, I just want to let you know that Egypt Colonize is this monthly class is absolutely free. So I really work hard to present the most, you know, uh, current research on our history, our identity. And I wanted to just make a, a point that because it's a public space and because it's, you know, free and anyone can access this, obviously we're going to get that's like a, a, a given. However, I want to empower you to ignore the trolls that happen to join us today. You know, they're looking for disruption, they're looking for your attention. So if you happen to come across them and um, they're being very inappropriate, disrespectful, you know, go ahead and block and delete them and do me that favor, please, because I have a lot to get to. So again, I want to nurture a safe space that centralizes our voice, Native, Indigenous, Brown folks. This is dedicated, this class is dedicated to the decolonization of our people in an interdisciplinary approach. Um, all ages are welcome, everyone is welcome. I have a zero tolerance for hate speech, as you already know, if you've been students of decolonized for a while. So if you see any, any anti-Indigenous, any anti-LGBTQ to spirit, any anti-Black comments, anything like that, go ahead and block and delete them. I believe um, I have one person that's administering, but everyone else can also do this. Please help me, help me get this straight. And again, let's ignore the trolls. We're here for each other. We're not here for to give them attention. And like I said, this is free. However, if you want to contribute to me, uh, donate to me and my family, I have a Cash App, Venmo, and Zelle. I have a Zelle, I have Cash App, and so if you want to hook me up, if you appreciate what I'm doing, if you want to help support my family, um, go ahead and do so right now. I am a mother of a six month old and we are transitioning where it looks like I'm going to be um, working from home because of our, our baby. We don't have a babysitter. So, you know, all this helps out whatever you can. This is absolutely free. So no, don't stress. OK, let's get into it. Latinidad, there's so much to unpack. Let's get to the basics. Let's get to the language. Let's get to the origins of the term Latino. So Latin originally, right, the historical etymology of Latin comes from uh, Rome, right? Latins are the Southern Europeans, an Italic language spoken in ancient Rome. Um, that was Latium, right? That's where someone that was from Latium was Latin. Um, this is an ancient Roman concept, an ancient Roman identity. So this is number one, the reason why we are not that. We are not ancient Romans. Um, the language that we speak, as we're going to get into, was introduced to us in a violent colonial genocidal manner. So a process of language and the way we started speaking Spanish, those of us who speak Spanish and English, had a lot to do with the colonial process. So let's get right into it. First and foremost, we know that the term Latin comes from Roman ancient, the ancient Romans. However, 
the concept of Latin America get coined up? How does this term come to us? What is the etymology of that? So according to the research, uh, a French economist by the name of Michel Scheer, uh, while traveling to America to distinguish between Latin and Anglo-Saxon people, he developed the idea that the Spanish and Portuguese speaking parts of the Americas, quote unquote, were connected and founded on a shared cultural and racial affinity with all romantic European peoples. Romantic, right? He argued that people in the so-called Americas were inhabited by people of the Latin race. Here we go, ancient Romans, which could be associated to Latin Europe, right? Those Europeans who spoke a romantic Roman romance uh, language, uh, he associated with Latin Europe. So this is the first time that we see the actual term coined, right? Latin America, like the landmass of Abyayala that is um, made up of people that he is differentiating. He's marking a distinction between who spoke um, a Romance language and said, oh, this is a part of the so-called Americas where they speak Latin languages, which is a difference to the Anglo people, Anglo language from the Northern parts of uh, Yala, right? So this is where we start to see the distinction of Latin America. Now, fast forward um, about 10 years, right? We have Napoleon III in 1860. Uh, who, most, most, some of you may know who this is, you know, may, some of you may be information than I do. Um, he was a French ruler who used the term Latin America to create a common heritage between France and Mexico during his attempted takeover of Mexico in the 1860s. Latin America was formerly known as Hispanic America, thereby implicitly excluding France. So they didn't want to leave France out of the bubble. So um, bringing up the term Latin encapsulates France as well. The term was then supported by the French Empire of Napoleon III during the French invasion of Mexico to include France as a country of influence on the area and to exclude English-speaking countries. Again, Spanish-speaking Europeans, English-speaking Europeans have had this animosity of colonization because they're trying to take over this land. They're trying to take over this space. So how are they connecting it? How are they building a culture that creates relevancy to how they're doing this? So he says, um, and to create a natural way to establish France's cultural and political role in that area. So Napoleon politicizes, right, this whole concept of Latin America in a way that favors the French as they're trying to culturally colonize Mexico, right, trying to establish an actual presence, an actual uh, course to Latinidad, to this whole concept of this is the Spanish speaking areas, um, we're going to, that Spanish comes from Latin, Latin is also encompasses a French language, let's just culturally take it on, let's culturally take over this, this territory and make it like a natural phenomenon why Mexico is naturally aligned to French culture, right? So then we're going to skip some centuries here, okay? <laughs> we're going to skip some centuries. So that is the origins, right? We got into the origins of Latin, knowledge of Latin, where it comes from, uh, who are the actual people that coined Latin America together. And then we have Napoleon. So now we have uh, Latin X, right? The research and the etymology that has been found on Latinx is they said that they found it like on some chat boards, some chat rooms before YouTube, before uh, social media. There used to be these things for those young ones out there. Um, there were chat rooms, right? It was like a thread and people can have conversations on it, kind of like a Facebook post, right? That you keep posting pictures, images, whatever. So there are some researchers that say that they found the term Latinx in those bubbles. And actually, um, Latinx has been in use since they have coined it. They found it in 2004. 
It was actually inducted into the Merriam-Webster Dictionary in 2018. And according to the argument, according to the logic, it says it was used to include non-binary people and dismantle the masculinity use of the term Latino. Right now, again, I want to be very, very clear. My criticism of the term Latinx has nothing to do with the criticism of our non-binary, um, you know, two-spirit LGBTQ community. Nothing to do with that. I understand why that was done. I understand the intention behind it, right? But my criticism is that Latin, the foundation of this that we're looking at is a European pro-colonial term, right? So it is patriarchal at its root. It is patriarchal at its foundation. Most European languages and linguists, if you're, if you're watching me and I get this wrong, let me know. Most European languages follow a patriarchal uh, distinction or inclusive tone in, in other words, right? So what I want to say is if you look at indigenous languages, it's like, why do we want to change a term that's already genocidal, that's already pro-colonial, that's already encompassed and dripping in patriarchy when we have a lot of examples in indigenous languages, right? We have a lot of examples of indigenous languages where the gender, the gender binary is non-existent in some languages, right? So instead of us trying to work within a genocidal term and concept, I strongly, strongly urge people to look within a non-Eurocentric approach to identity and say, wait a second, why am I, why is this language so patriarchal? Why is it only centered? Why is this a male-focused, male-centered language um, and salutations? And then you compare it to indigenous languages and many indigenous globally, not just in Abiyayala, but globally. And so what I say is we should always support our two-spirit LGBTQ family and understand the intention, but that does not wipe away like our pain of what is Latinx. Now, another criticism that I have is the Latinx word was completely embraced, right? By academia, by mainstream media. Uh, you have um, all these, I, I haven't seen the Spanish speaking media, but basically English speaking media, a lot of them, a lot of so-called progressive people in academia, they're using Latinx and running with it, right? So to me, that shows you how it doesn't threaten anything. The fact that it was so easily incorporated into the mainstream media, into what they're using to call our communities, that's a reflection that it's pro-colonial, that it's pro-white supremacy. They said, okay, cool, add an X, cool, let's add an X, right? It doesn't dismantle the, de -col the colonial, the white supremacist foundation of Latinidad. Right. So whether we add an X, whether we add an E, whether we spell it with an H or however we spell it, it all means genocide. Right. And so that's why I want to tell people, yes, we should be um, for our communities, all of our people, right, to spirit LGBTQ, you know, all of our people where we are community, we are embraced, we love our we love our people. But again, using a genocidal term or pro-colonial term and only adding and trying to change it up to represent non-binary folks, again, is not attacking the root of the problem. The root of the problem is native erasure. The root of the problem is that Latin is a Eurocentric identity that, that centralizes whiteness, that establishes Eurocentricity, European culture as the norm that we are all defined through. That is my problem with Latinx. Again, Latinidad, Latinx, Latini. All of that, all of that is European. It's all Eurocentric and pro-colonial. Now let's get into the Latino market. This is gonna be fun. It's kind of like a class in economics. I'm showing off my shirt. I'm showing off my shirt, sorry. Little moment, little moment. Uh, anyway, we'll get to that later. Um, 
the Latino market, right? Let's talk about the Latino market. How did this market begin? How did it become such a massive concept that flew, that it was like all over? If you talk to your parents or family members before the 80s, you know, before the late 70s, no one really used the term Latino, right? Everyone was Mexican or Puerto Rican or Salvadorian. Like that was how people spoke and related to communities. But what happened in the 70s? Let's take a look. This is extremely, extremely important. I invite you to check out this book, Race and Classification, The Case of Mexican America. It's really, really, really important for you to take a look at this book because not only does it talk about Latinidad, um, it offers you great kind of uh, evidence to how this was construction, was how I was constructed and how it was an inorganic construction, right? It, people gathered and said, oh, okay, yeah, we're going to call ourselves Latinos now. We're going to do this. It has nothing to do with the community. It has nothing to do with grassroots, anything like that. This is definitely a production of the market, of the economic system, right? So let's take a, a read into this book, right? This quote says, um, the concept of Latino. It has been an invention of Cuban American advertising executives in South Florida and New York, who in the 1970s and 80s were eager to lump and homogenize small Latin American again, quote, uh, national group identities into a larger unitary market sector. If they could create a clearly identifiable Latino market, they stood to profit enormously, right? They could then persuade large food, beverage, and domestic product manufacturers that Latinos constituted a significant mass market that needed special advertising campaigns only that only these agents were ex expertly prepared to address. Now, this is really important, right? Why Cuban Americans? If those of you who know about the Cuban revolution, if you know Cuban history, you know, there was a particular group of Cuban immigrants into the United States who came with wealth. Right. These were the people that were already running the racist systems and institutions of Cuba. And so when they left Cuba, right, when they were kicked out, some of them, um, they had this wealth already. A lot of them gained instant citizenship from the U.S. government. So they came with wealth. Right. They came with wealth already with that power trip in of, that they had in Cuba. So the fact that they just wanted to create an umbrella term that just homogenized, homogenized means you use one thing for everything, right? One size fits all, everyone's the same. Um, it tells you a lot about how they viewed those of our peoples that are Spanish speaking. And at that time, the majority of those people were Mexican, Mexican Central American. That's the majority of the people, right? That spoke Spanish in this time. And so this tells you that what was done here was saying, you know what, they're all the same. They're all going to buy the same beer. They're all going to listen to the same music. They're all So it's manufacturing all of these different people, right? All of these different identities, all these cultures into one, not for our sake, not to make it easy for us, right? It was to make it easy for the market system, for the marketers, instead of them having to spend money on different populations like okay we're going to market the mexicans we're going to market the the salvadorians we're going to market the hondureños what they did because that's a lot of money and if you know about marketing it they take millions sometimes millions of dollars sometimes into market how to market people how to get their consumerism right so instead of doing that, what they said was like, fuck it, let's just all put them all together. There's all the same people. They all speak Spanish. So there you go, right? No consideration or regard for the differences in those communities, for the different socioeconomic um, statuses, for the different diversity complexities, nothing like that. It was all a market. It was a market, right? So I, what I put here is that this is a Eurocentric exploitation of Spanish brown people, right? So this is really, really important, really important. And then we're gonna get into the census, why this matters. 
So for the benefit of these of this elite, right? This elite of Cuban um, wealthy folks and other folks, for that elite to gain monetary wealth, right, and exploit us, they created this massive term to group all these massive groups of people. But yet, who are the elite who are controlling Spanish-speaking media? Who are the who are the elite that are controlling um, the market, the Spanish-speaking market in this country, in this colony? It's this group of people, right? And if you follow my TikTok, I did a small. Um, I did a small little video to show you who runs Univision and Telemundo, who are the executives, right, of all that. So here we go. This is a really old slide that I have that is like relevant. To me, it's relevant, continues to be relevant, even though a lot of these people you probably don't know. Um, so yeah, so if you look, Google, you know, his, Hispanic marketing, Google Latino marketing, there's all these companies that charge companies saying, oh, we know how to get you the Hispanic product. We know how to get you the Hispanic customer, the, the Latino customer. So it becomes a business within itself, right? So we have a term that was promoted to, to exploit our people, but then we have a business created on how to do that, right? So it's interesting how this all works out. It's very, very interesting. So here we go. It says that by grouping all people who speak Spanish in one group, corporations can target one audience at the same time and therefore maximize exposure and profit. So another thing that we had to talk about in this post I did last year, um, this is really, really important when people say, oh, no, it's Latino, la comunidad Latina, like all this. But yet you watch Spanish speaking media. And what do you watch? What do you see? You see blue eyed, bleach, white Mexicans, white like Puerto Ricans. Like this is real. And I've done a class. If you look at my class on when I talk about the history of Mexico, these are actual Europeans born in Mexico, right? Who are governed, who are taking over the media and in Televisa and Univision, Telemundo. Like the other day, kid you not, like I, well, actually a few months ago, I was watching Univision and they have like straight up Europeans as anchors. I think if they had a Spaniard or two Spaniards, right? And I was like, wait a second, what am I watching? Like, is this from Spain? No, this was Telemundo or it was Univision, like straight up Spaniards talking about what happened in East LA, talking about news that happened in LA. Like, and I'm like, wait a second, what, what am I watching here? Like they're getting straight Europeans, right? To speak Spanish, these positions of representation in our community in a media that the majority of our people are watching and what are they telling you? That this is a prime example. Este sí es un verdadero Latino, un verdadero Hispano, right? And so you look at the media and then you look at our community and you're like, wait a second. Like, if we're talking about equity. We're talking about representation. Like, this does not match, right? And then getting into the anti-Blackness also in Telemundo and Univision. Like, forget all the other stuff, right? There's the race indigenous people, Afro-Indigenous people, Asian people, like the racism is all over the Spanish speaking media outlets. And again, if you look at my TikTok video, I get into who is the executive board, who runs these channels, right? These are uh, white Spanish speaking Europeans who are the CEOs, who are the ones that decide what gets promoted, what, get, what this is done, right? What, the, what happens in our community. And so I tell people, right, especially the way that they covered Black Lives Matter, the way that they covered protests, if you paid attention, and I know a lot of you did, you know, a lot of our parents, they sounded like conservative, like after watching, Canal, you know, Channel 34, 11 o'clock news, like what the heck, like where, where have you been watching? Right, they only interviewed like white Cubans, um, they only interviewed like those conservatives, people from Florida, it's really rare that they interview people of so-called so people of color, right? Brown and black who are not on that agenda of conservatism, of pro-Trump. And it was very interesting, right? It was very interesting. And they used to have, they also had Latinos for Trump on there. Like they give them a big, like a big old segment of Latinos for Trump. That tells you a lot about the political agenda of what they view 
as powerful as so anyway, my post says, denunciamos al racismo de estas dos corporaciones que promueven agendas eurocéntricas, anti-indígenas y anti-negras. So one of the things we're going to get into is what can we do about this, right? We know that this is happening. We obviously are, are being exploited by this because, right, our people that watch this, the more money that they make, that they care about our communities. So one of the things um, I got criticized on on TikTok, which is interesting to me because I was like, wow, okay, this says a lot. Because I, I did a video talking about what unity, right? They're talking about Latinos Unidos, like we're all one. And I'm like, wait a second, let's break this down. Let's break up this little mini unidad, right? What is unity? A unity that's based on Spanish language, um, speaking Spanish language. So let's get into the history of how that happened. Spanish language is a product of colonization and imposition. It's not something that we're like, oh, we have to speak Spanish so we can all get united. Like that's not what happened. Like the process of how a lot of us uh, started speaking Spanish was a process of genocide, right? It was a process of genocide. So it celebrates, right? It centralizes Spanishness. It centralizes a European language. It celebrates the genocide and erasure of indigenous people and other people of color, right? It erases indigenous, it erases black, it erases Asian, it, it, anything, anything like not European or white, it erases, right? It erases and it says, no, this is what it is. This is what's important. This is what's gonna define you. It doesn't take into account socioeconomic status. It was hilarious the way that they were trying to talk about the Latino vote in the Trump, you know, when Trump won, uh, was running for office, it was hilarious because a lot of so-called Latinos voted for Trump. So it's like, oh, what's the Latino vote? Do you have the Latino vote? And it's like, are we talking about the white Cuban conservatives? Are we talking about, you know, an indigenous person? Like, what are you talking about? Socioeconomic status, who are we talking about? What communities are you talking about? Like the fact that they're trying to use an umbrella term that completely disregards all of those aspects is, is ridiculous. Um, and also, right, Republic Latinos or Democratic Latinos, which ones are you talking about, right? They make it seem like, oh, the Latino vote. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean when you're trying to get our vote, when you're trying to come into our communities? Like, who are you talking to? You gotta be very specific when you're dealing with our communities. Let's not remember, let's not forget <laughs> reason five, predominant white Latinos so Hawaii, exploit the majority of non-Latino and gain monetary gains for this exploitation. Like I was talking about the Cuban American, right? The Cuban Americans. So we have Europeans, right? Speaking Spanish, taking over the couples, running these, these companies and they're exploiting the majority of the population who is not a white European Spanish speaking person. Right, so what they're doing is using this facade that we're all the same people, we're all the same, but the ones that are in power, the ones that get to call shots, the ones that are getting the fiscal gains are, are, um, are these white Europeans. And yet those of our people, brown and black communities are completely exploited, not taken into account whatsoever. So yeah, like I said, there is no unity. There is absolutely no unity. This whole claim and a lot of you're dividing the community. It's like, no, this community was made up to benefit this capital agenda of um, these white, again, Spanish speaking Europeans, let's not forget. So let's get into it. What can we do, right? We know this, we know where it came from, we know the etymology of Latinidad. What can we do? Well, have you guys heard the term Hispanic? Like I, rarely hear it. I rarely hear Hispano. I rarely hear it. There's been a lot of pushback. A lot of people didn't like it because it's completely Spanish centric, right? So to me, it's not hard. It's not going to be hard. It's not like going to take a, a 10,000 years to do this. We have the power. All of us watching this, right? If you are a content creator, if you're an educator, parent, all of you watching this have the power to Latinidad, get rid of it now in our lifetime, not next year, not in 30 years. Now we can get rid of this because why Latinidad needs us, right, to continue to remain a powerful concept. If we refuse it, 
if we reject it, they can no longer use it to count us, to put us together. So let's get into action. A lot of people say, okay, well, I know this, I know that. What, what can I do? There's a lot of things we can do. For those of you who participated in the census, that was one way, right? Not identifying as Hispanic or Latino, um, identifying as Native. Um, you can boycott it. Don't use it at all, right? I challenge people, don't say Latino for a whole day. Tell me how it went, right? Don't use Latino for a day. Use other words, whatever, come up, be creative, but don't use Latino or Hispano, right, for a day. Uh, you could write emails and letters to different mainstream media and tell them why it's offensive and racist. One of the things I forgot to put on here, put a hashtag, put a hashtag, Univision, Telemundo. Trust me, they're watching social media. They are paying attention. When I criticize Univision and Telemundo, people, you know, they try to follow me or they try to message me and all this. So if all of us were to do this, not Hispanic or Latina, is racist, hashtag them, right? Hashtag Univision, hashtag Telemundo. They're going to be forced to talk about this, right? And if you notice, ever so often they do little surveys of people identify, and it's always pro-Latino, right? They never try to bring in that voice that is against these colonial terms. Why? Because it doesn't benefit them. It doesn't serve their interests. Create content, like just like I'm doing, making a video, making a post, making a meme, you know, post a video on your social media, even if you don't do it, right? Talk about it with your family and friends. Create stuff. Uh, again, do not mark Hispanic or Latino on any questionnaire. If you're enrolling your kid into school, don't mark Hispanic or Latino. In a job application, don't mark Hispanic or Latino. I recommend, I suggest Native, Native American, American Indian, whichever it is, but do not mark Hispanic or Latino. If there's an empty box where you can put something, put where you're from. If you don't know your nation or tribe, put the rancho you're from, put the pueblo you're from, put the municipio you're from right? We don't have to do everything they want us to do. We don't have to abide by that. We don't have to, you know, squeeze ourselves into the, into that box. And if you're biracial, triracial, put that in there. We don't have to play this game of your only Hispanic or Latino. That's it. That's all we recognize. No, it's not. Educate yourself, right? Educate yourself and your loved ones. Make sure that they know that this is wrong right? Especially our youth, right? Our youth. And trust me, they know what's up. Like you explain this to them, it makes perfect sense to them. They're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Like it's not an issue, right? And then when people say, okay, well, if we're not Latino, then what are we? Well, like, I, like I've been talking about, we have existed before, before the term Latino, right? We have existed. Years ago, I was using the term Nicantlaca. Years ago, I was like, okay, we can use that to kind of group together everyone that's, you know, brown, indigenous from the continent. But honestly, within the last few years, I don't, you know, I didn't feel comfortable with that. I was like, wait a second, why am I using one? Why am I boycotting one homogenous term and then gonna bring in another one? I don't want to use any homogenous term. So I was like, no, I'm not going to use that either, right? So I tell people, we had other identities before the Latino term came, right? You could be creative. You can honor your ancestors without having to use their terms, right? So like I said, let's not homogenize ourselves with another term. Let's reclaim who we are and celebrate the diverse and unique traits that make us who we are. So because a lot of people have asked me, then what are we? I have some suggestions that may help you on your journey, right? Um, I made a post on Instagram talking about this. Like when people say, okay, well, what are we then? What are we like? Some people just want like you to tell them, okay, use this term. Okay, cool. No, it's not like that either. It's not, it's not going to use one term. For this, this is what I suggest. Okay. Depending on, and I, in the perspective I'm speaking of us, I speak as a detribalized um, native person, right? That's who I am connecting with. There's many of our people who never lost connection. There's many of our people who were not conquered, who were not displaced, who were not communities, who are still intact, who still speak an indigenous language. However, there's those other indigenous people like myself, like many of folks out there who, um, whose you know, ancestors were displaced, did leave. In my family, it was my third 
yeah, third grandparent from my mother's side, from what I know, who's the last to speak Nahuatl and live in actual um, original community, right? So a lot of us, if we study Mexican history and the way the policies work, there was this pressure on indigenous societies and communities to stop, stop speaking an indigenous language, to stop, become mo modern, to go work for a factory, to go work for a transnational factory that was taking over the local economies. And so that's how you get a massive displacement of indigenous people. Anyway, we get into that to another video. But these are the suggestions I have for you, right? If you know your nation or tribe, claim it. If you've made contact with your nation or tribe and they've accepted you and you've got the process beautiful, if you don't know that, but you know your pueblo, you know your rancho, put that on the put that on the census on the form. If you want to use a nation as a starting point, like I tell people, I changed my channel to Mexican Excellence because a lot of people were like, "What's ni cantleca? I don't get it." The majority of the people don't know this information we're talking about. The majority of the people, all they know is Mexican, Central American. So to me, I made a conscious, you know, choice. A selection to make the name of my channel Mexican Excellence, even though I don't agree with the Mexican nationalism and all that stuff. I'm using Mexican Excellence kind of like, okay, this is what people know. I'm going to put that out there. People are, are relating to that. They find my channel and hopefully learn this information, right? So you can say I'm a detribalized person. I'm a reconnecting person. I'm culturally Chicana, racially. I'm culturally... Uh, Chicana racially native. I'm a reconnecting native. I'm a detribalized native. I'm a reconnecting indigenous person. I'm a detribalized indigenous person. I am culturally, we could say Mexican, racially indigenous. I am culturally Peruvian, racially indigenous. You can also say native Mexican, native Peruvian, native Guatemalan. These are just some suggestions, right? Like again, we're not forced to create one homogenous term just because we want to replace Latinidad. That's not, you know, to me, I find that problematic. So to me, it's like, no, we're all so different. There's so many cultures, there's so many identities that we can reclaim as who we are. And look at your history, look at your family tree, look at who you are. Chances are you'll find this information, right? So these are the suggestions that I am making. And I cannot leave or end this class without talking about the past census responses. Oh my goodness, we gotta get into it. I know it's already going on 40 minutes, but okay, five more minutes. And then we'll get into a few of the questions and comments. Did y'all see the results of the census? It was amazing. Let me give you a little bit of an example of why I'm so excited about this. In the year 2000, okay, this is, I know I'm, I'm older than y'all. In the year 2000, uh, almost half of those, this is a quote, right, from the LA Times article in uh, May 20, 2001, almost half of those who reported their ethnicity as Latino reported their race as white, right? And now we have in 2020, right, this is on the right side, we have the number of people of Hispanic or Latino origin who identified as white alone decreased by 52.9% down from 26.7 million to 12.6 million over. This is amazing. So what we're seeing here is a decentralizing, all right, of whiteness. We're still working on the whole Hispanic or Latino thing, but our people are at least not selecting white anymore. A lot of the people do this. A lot of our people select white on the census because they're confused because of the shame of being associated with being indigenous or not as native. There's so many things, but this is a huge example to show you how things have gotten better, a little bit better, right? Where we have to do with the Hispanic Latino thing, but at least the race thing, it's like, okay, they're not marking white, at least not as much as they used to. And then this completely blew my mind. It, I was like, what the heck? Like, okay, so I graduated the year 2000 from high school. Obviously, I don't remember what we put on that census. I don't even think we did. But in 2010, I was like, no. In 2010, I've been decolonizing since 97. But in 2010, I was like, all right, you know, I actually put indigenous, I put Native American, and I think I put uh, Nawa, right? I think I put Nawa. So anyway, we have this year's, uh, the results of the 2020 census are showing us 
that out of all the Native, out of the numbers of Native Americans on the census, nearly 30% of those are actually so-called Latino. So that represents our people that are trying, right? They're trying, they're like, they're, obviously they're still using the term Latino, but we get what they're getting at. They're not choosing what they're acknowledging. They're saying, I am native. So to me, I hope that the next 10 years that we see the census, we see a whole lot of different things, right? We see that our people are actually a, a percentage, right? Are claiming who they are. So that's, important to me. Uh, one second here. Uh, okay. Anyway, so that's really important, right? It's really, really important that we get to this. So it says in 2020 census, Native population was increased by 86.5%, right? 86.5%, that's a huge jump. And it's funny because if you see some of the news articles, there are people are like, whoa, we don't understand why this jump took place. Like, hello, like, you know, a lot of us are waking up. So let's get into a little bit more of the, the facts that came out of the census. 30% of Native American are actually so-called Latino, right? We have 2.9, so out of the whole U.S. population, 2.9 were um, are, are under the category of Native American. 3.7 people, 3.7 million people identified as American Indian or Alaska alone. 5.9 million were in combination of one race or more, and 9.7 million alone or in combination, right? So they put them together. And one important thing to look at, um, one really important thing to look at, Native Americans, and this is a quote from Indian Country. I have the articles at the end of this class. I'm going to share with you the articles that I have on here. Native Americans were not counted in the US Census until 1860 but have been counted every, um, every sentence since. Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islanders were not counted until 1960. And Hispanic or Latino people were counted once in 1930, but not again in 1970. So this is really, really important for all of you who are working on this, for all of you who are talking about your family, who all of you who participated in the census and chose, um, and chose this, please let me know. Um, one second here. All right. So colonialism and genocide do not define us. Let's conclude, right? Colonialism and genocide do not define our people. They define historical time, a historical time of our temporary occupation, right? That's, that's what happens here, right? And Latinidad is pro-colonial. Latinidad is pro-genocide. Latinidad is pro-whiteness. Pro so that concludes the class. I'm going to get into a few more things with you. I want to first thank you for joining me. I want to also let you know, besides doing my free monthly class of We Decolonize, I've decided to launch a private course so that I don't have to deal with all these, you know, uh, a lot of people online, a lot of trolls, as y'all have been seeing, like there's some people that don't have better things to do. To make our time more intentional, to make our time more effective, I created uh, private courses for you to colonize. I have one that's actually starting on Wednesday and Saturday called the Colonial History of the Americas. Um, I am going to also start teaching it again in October. I have a course that's coming up in December called the Colonial History of Mexico. That's gonna be actually four sessions. It says three, but it's actually gonna be four sessions. Um, and I'm also gonna teach a three session course called Indigenous Women of Mesoamerica. I'm really, really excited for that. Um, and I'm also working on a workshop, which I'm really excited, really excited uh, for all of you who it's called Activism 101. It's gonna be a two hour, a two hour workshop on activism, how to organize without machismo and ego trips. Because honestly, in the 24 years that I've been an activist and that I've seen these circles, what happens is one of these things destroys the organization. One of these things is what makes these infighting and these organizations implode. I also invite you to check out my website, citlali-anahuac.com and my Instagram, right? So let's get into some questions or comments. 
I'm not going to make a question on the other people that are claiming our people are from somewhere else. We are from this continent. Thank you very much. Uh, you could take that rhetoric somewhere else. We're not here to cater to anyone who is trying to assault our identity, our culture, and our civilizations. Anyways, this is my class that I'm going to be teaching in October if you are interested. Um, it, it's a five-week session called Decloning History of the Americas. I'm actually going to teach this already, but if my class is already full, I have a, a max of 20 people um, for this class. And registration, if you want to register, you have to go to the tiny URL, edfall2. Okay? So Decloning History of the Americas, it's a five-week session. We get into intro to history and key concepts contributions of the Americas, genocide and occupation, deconstructing colonial identities, rethinking the Spanish conquest of Mexico and native perspectives. I'm really, really, really important, uh, excited for this. So this is one of the classes that's coming up. I'm already teaching this um, this month. So the next opening is gonna be for October 20 through November 17. This is only for BPOC only. This is only for black indigenous people of color, brown, black, indigenous people of color. That is who I am intending this course for. Um, and I'm really intentional about that. So that is part of my selection. Next month for e Decolonize, because I'm teaching a Saturday class, I'm not going to do e Decolonize on a, on, a, on a Saturday. I'm doing it on Saturday, on a Sunday. So my next class is called Women Warriors of Mesoamerica. For those of you who don't know, I wrote an entire thesis on indigenous women of Mesoamerica in the 16th century. Um, so this is what we're gonna be getting into next month. So again, next month is gonna be not the last Saturday of the month, it's gonna be the last Sunday of the month. And that's because I am teaching already a class on Saturday. So join me, I'm gonna like, uh, I'm really excited. This is probably my favorite subject, my favorite topic to teach. Um, it's what I wrote my thesis on. It's so much. And I have to share this again. So, you know, most of us, when we talk about Mesoamerican women, all we know is Malinche. That's it, right? We don't know other women um, that were also really important warriors um, in the same time of the so-called Spanish conquest. So anyway, last five minutes, I have some questions or comments. Like I said, I'm not here to answer back to people trying to jack our civilizations and cultures. So anybody have any questions for me before I leave you for the day? Um, thank you, I'm reading some of the, some of the comments. I'm not gonna read anti-indigenous comments, which it looks like there's a lot of anti-indigenous comments on here. So I'm not interested in that. Um, anyway, um, anybody have any questions before I go? Yeah, so Chicana, from what I understand, Chicana, a, a lot of people, a lot of people from Central America use the term because it's open, it's open to our people. I Even though it was a very specific term, that was created, like, no, definitely all, all of our people are welcome to use Chicana. Like I have never seen anyone have an issue with that. So I say that our people from Central America absolutely uh, can use Chicana. I agree, Lo mama. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay, so two more minutes before I go. Like I said, I'm not gonna respond to any anti-Indigenous. Um, I'm just gonna say this, our world existed before any worldview outside of the Americas was invented or created. So those of us here, this space is for the honoring of our ancestors and they're respectable, they're, they're unique and they're complex worldviews that were created on this continent with our own intelligence and our own scientific observations. So no, I'm not here for anti-Indigenous people that are all over the place, especially because this is YouTube. My students who are here that um, 
are being bothered by that, please ignore them. There's nothing else for, um, for them to do. Um, this is space is for us. Exactly why I did my class. So we don't have to deal with folks like that. So if you're interested in my private course, um, look at my, you can go to my website, you can go to my Instagram and we talk about this, right? We talk about um, my courses. I have one that I'm teaching Wednesdays and Saturdays. And then I have one that I'm teaching that I'm gonna be teaching three more classes by the end of the year. Really excited about it. I'm excited about it being uh, intentional, it being closed private so again we get to a lot of topics and issues and i'm really excited for that because i think that's much needed and also i'm only going to be recording the lecture part of these classes i'm not going to record the discussion because i want to honor and create a safe space for everybody um especially because it's private i've been to a lot of private spaces where when that's done it's amazing right like people feel more safe to share, people feel more safe to talk about their experiences. And I wanna honor that. I wanna definitely focus on that. So that being said, thank you so much for joining me this month. I will see you next month. Don't forget, Sunday, September 26th at 12 p.m. We are gonna get into the topic of women warriors of Mesoamerica. So stay tuned for that. That is gonna be next uh, our next month's class. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone who joined, uh, who made it through all these comments. And yeah. All right, everybody. Stay beautiful. Stay indigenous. Stay decolonizing. This is Itlali from E Decolonize. Until next time. Thank you. Have a beautiful, beautiful rest of your weekend.